This is Lesson 27, Function Applications. And of course, like always, if you've missed or skipped any of the previous videos and you become lost or confused, just check the video's description for links to helpful videos. In video 20D, we learned about functions. A function is an input-output relationship that has exactly one output for each input. It has one y value for each x value. And I showed you this once before earlier in the playlist. There's different names for x and y. x could be called the domain, the input, see? It's the x-coordinate on a coordinate plane, and it's the first members in a relation, like ordered pairs. It's the first one. The y can be called the range, or the output. The y-coordinate on a coordinate plane, it can also be called the f of x, which means the function of x. It's also the second members in a relation in an ordered pair. So, depending on the value of x, it's going to change the value of y. If x is 1, then y is 2. 2 times 1 is 2. If x is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, y is 4. We can make a function table of values that will make this true. And they'll become our ordered pairs. We learned about that also. See? 1, 2, 2, 4. See? So, as x changes, it affects the value of y. A function that can be described by y equals mx plus b is a linear function. When graphed on a coordinate plane, it makes a straight line. And we learned about this in lesson 22, about slope. The b is the y-intercept where the line crosses the, the, the y-axis. So that's y-intercept b, okay? Function type problems are problems that rely on one value like pay per hour that depends on another value, like the number of hours worked, to find the total paycheck. That's a function. As the input of hours worked changes, it changes the output as the total paycheck. So take a look at this graph. This person makes $10 per hour. Here's the number of hours worked, and here's the paycheck in dollars, okay? So this is money. And this is the hours worked. If they work zero hours, they get zero pay, see? they work one hour, they make $10. We have one for X, 10 for Y. If he works two hours, he makes 20. Three hours, he makes 30. See? We have our function table here showing the X and Y values. So with this constant $10 per hour, depending on the hour's work is going to affect the pay. And it's linear. See how it makes a straight line? It even has a slope, doesn't it? Total cost is the function of number of items we buy. If a hamburger costs $2, well, depending on how many hamburgers we buy is going to affect on how much we own the cashier, isn't it? So if we get three hamburgers, well, then the total cost is going to be six. If we buy one hamburger, then the total cost will be two. See? If the number of items we buy increases, the total cost increases. That's a function. Store A pays $50 per day plus $2 for each shirt sold. Store B pays $4 per shirt sold. So it doesn't have a daily pay. It just pays $4 per shirt. At both stores, the pay P is a function of the number of shirts S that are sold. So at store A, we've got the pay P is equal to the $50 per day plus $2 for every shirt sold. Okay? Store B, the pay is equal to just $4 per shirt sold. They both have per shirt sold. See that? If a salesperson can sell 30 shirts per day, which store would pay more? So if a salesperson can sell 30 shirts per day, which store would pay more? Let's plug this 30 in for S for the amount of shirts sold. Store A has $50 plus $2 times 30. That would give us $110, 50 plus 60. Store B, 4 times $30, $4 times $30 gives us $120. So store B would pay more. But as this value for shirts changes, it's going to change the pay. If store A had 15 shirts sold, 2 times 15 is 30, plus the 50 would be 80, and 4 times 15 is 60. So in this case, if you only sold 15 shirts, store A would pay better, see, because of that $50 a day. It gets to a point where there's a tipping point 
where store A would end up being better pay because of that $50 base pay. See? But that's a function because as this changes, the pay changes. Okay? A gym charges $30 for a one-month membership plus $1.50 for each aerobics class. What is the total cost for a month with eight aerobic classes? So that means Y, the total cost, is going to equal that $30 a month plus $1.50 times however many aerobics classes we take. And if we take eight classes, we do the $1.50 times eight, and that's $12. We add that to the 30, and we get 42. But what if the person didn't take any aerobics classes? Well, then that would be zero, and it would just be 30. So depending on what this value is, is going to affect that total value. See? It's a function. Salespeople at XYZ Incorporated earn $70 a day, that's going to be D, plus a 5% commission on their total sales, S. Which formula can be used to determine their pay, P? Now remember, 5% is 0 0.05 as a decimal, all right? We learned that a long time ago in uh, this GED playlist, okay? So it's going to have 0 0.05, and we can see 0 0.05 in a lot of these, all right? So it's seventy dollars a day plus point zero five commission percent. You know, it's the five percent commission point zero five on their total sales s. We have these five to choose from. To make it easy on ourselves, we can just imagine and plug in some numbers like they worked two days. So that means seventy dollars a day for two days would be seventy times two, wouldn't it? And the point zero five would be multiplied to S. We would do 0 0.05, and let's say the commission was, a, let's say the sales were $100. So we would get 70 times 2 plus 0 0.05 times 100, okay? We can look at this and try to find the same type of equation in our choices. And this matches the 70D, the number of days, plus the 0 0.05 times the sales. That would be number 4, see? So sometimes by using real numbers, it can help us find the correct equation. Just use very simple ones like 10, 100, 2, you know, 3, little numbers like that, and try to use round numbers so it's real easy to multiply by 10 or 100, right? Okay. To convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, we use the formula 9 fifths times C plus 32 equals F, where C is Celsius and F is Fahrenheit. The hottest recorded temperature in Death Valley was 54 degrees Celsius in 2013. What's this temperature in Fahrenheit? So this is a function because as Celsius changes, Fahrenheit changes. And we've got 54 for our Celsius. We're going to do 9 fifths times 54. When we find out what that is, then we're going to add the 32. So the first thing we're going to do is multiply. We can write the 54 over a 1 because when we multiply fractions, that way, we can multiply numerator to numerator and get a new numerator, denominator to denominator and get a new denominator, right? So we get 9 times 54 divided by 5 times 1. That gives us 486 divided by 5. That gives us 97.2. Now we add that 32. So see how all along we did this part and the 32 just kind of floated with us until the end and then we added it? We get 129.2 degrees Fahrenheit in Death Valley. That's pretty hot, okay? Now, to change Fahrenheit to Celsius, this one was Celsius to Fahrenheit. Now, to do Fahrenheit to Celsius, we have the Fahrenheit. We want to know what Celsius is. We can do F minus 32, that's Fahrenheit minus 32, times 5, and then divide by 9, and that'll give us Celsius. Now, you might see it written like this. Look at how these look compared to each other. You might see the C equals on this side. Well, that doesn't matter which side that's on. And the F minus 32 times 5 ninths. These are actually the same thing, and this is why. We know when we go to multiply fractions, we can just put this one over a 1 so that we can multiply straight across, right? Numerator to numerator, denominator to denominator. That means we have... If we connect this all as one big fraction bar, we have Fahrenheit minus 32 times 5 over 1 times 9, which means we have Fahrenheit minus 32 times 5 divided by 9, which is the exact same thing I've got here. Look at that. 
See how we slowly got there by putting it over a 1 and multiplying the denominator, making one big fraction bar? All right? So the order of operations, PEMDAS says we're going to have to do parentheses first. Now, what we do is we do everything in the numerator first. We ignore the denominator for now. So we have 70, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and we want to know what that is in Celsius. 70 minus 32 is 38. Now we can multiply 38 times 5, and we get 190. And see how the 9 just kept following along? Now we divide 190 by 9. And it came out to a decimal, so it's approximately 21 degrees Celsius. Okay? And there's a quick way of doing this, but it's not exact. You double the Celsius and add 30. So if we double this, we'll get 42, and if we add 30, we'll have 72. So see how it's not exact, but it's close. So if someone said to you, oh, it's 15 degrees Celsius, you'd say, well, 15 plus 15 is 30. We add 30, that's 60. Oh, it's about 60 degrees outside, all right? So you can do it real quick. You double the Celsius, then you add 30, okay? So when you see complicated fractions like this, we do the numerator first and solve everything in the numerator, then we solve everything in the denominator, and then we divide last, okay? Now, it's not always this way, and I'll show you over here in a second about canceling out, but to make it easy on yourself, do everything in the numerator first. We have 2 plus 3, that's a 5, and it's squared. Now we do the exponents because of order of operations, parentheses, exponents, right? 5 times 5 is 25, so that means we have 5 times 25, which is 125. And 2 times 5 is 10. Now we divide last, see? We did each one separately. We did the numerator separately from the denominator until we got it simplified like this. And 125 divided by 10 is 12.5. Now, a lot of times, what you can do is you can cancel the factors. When we were at 5 times 25 over 2 times 5, like right here, we can cancel this 5 and this 5 out as a 1. When you're multiplying, it doesn't matter the order. 2 times 5 is the same thing as 5 times 2. So it's 5 times 25 over 5 times 2. And you can see, same numerator and denominator, these can cancel out as a 1. See? That means we have 25 divided by 2, which is 12.5. See? So you can actually do this in algebra and you can cancel out, but don't do it right away. You could, but it's easier on the eyes if you get going a little bit and then you do it. We could have done it up here. We could have canceled that five and that five and just had the two plus three squared over the two. We could have done it way up there. Once you get good at this, you'll be able to do that. We can even do it when there's variables in it. Here we have five X and two plus three in parentheses with the 2. So we just stuck an x there. Same thing. We do the parentheses first. We get a 5. We do the exponent. It's 25. We have 5x minus 25. That gives us 125x. And we divide it by 10. We get 12.5x. See? All right. So you should now be ready to do the skill focus on page 319. And if you've somehow happened into this video and you've never really learned algebra before, let's say you went to your freshman year of high school when you dropped out and you never really learned algebra, this is going to be very difficult to learn all of this in this playlist. My advice to you is to go back and watch my entire Algebra 1 playlist and start from scratch. Okay? I'm going to explain more about this in the next video. We're going to talk about putting the GED test into perspective and what you're expected to learn compared to students that go to school year-round and graduate from high school regularly. If you did take algebra in high school and maybe you got to the middle of your junior year or your senior year and then you dropped out and that's why you're taking the GED, then this GED playlist will probably help you. But if you don't no algebra and you've never learned it, I highly doubt that five little lessons in a GED book are going to teach you everything that another student learned over years, okay? It's not fair to you. If you need more help about these functions, there's going to be links to the grade, the chapter six videos from grade eight and the chapter 12 videos from algebra one and of course the previous videos for this lesson 27, all right? 
Many of you should be ready to go on and take the GED test now. You might want to go back and review any videos. Go back through the GED playlist here, this math playlist, and scan the video titles for videos that you think you should watch again before taking the test because sometimes if you take a break and you study the GED for a couple weeks and then you quit for a month and then come back to it, you might have forgotten a lot of stuff. You want to keep going. You want to keep going at a steady pace like climbing stairs, okay? So review anything you think you might need to and then go take that test. And if you do pass it, let me know. Tell me in the comments. Come back to this last video and say, I did it. I made it. If you had trouble, you can let me know and maybe I can help guide you, okay? So I'll see you in the next video. We'll talk about putting the GED test into perspective and hopefully it'll be inspirational for you. And I'll see you there. I'm proud of you. Bye.